I really don't think that I've ever been so conflicted with any other product on any other airline on any other flight, ever. I'm going to explain exactly what I mean in this trip report, so let's get into it. Welcome to Delhi. If you'd like to know the exact fare that I paid for my flight or my next five videos in queue, please check out the description below. And if you're new here, hi there and welcome to the channel. My name is Kevin. The internet needs more honest content, plain and simple, and that's why I'm here. I make airline trip reports, high-end hotel reviews, and cruise ship tours as well. I self-fund all of my videos, and I don't alert any company that I'm coming, because I want to have as normal of an experience as possible. So, in this video today, I'm going to give you nothing more than my own personal, honest, and unbiased opinion. When I was making the graphics for this video a few weeks ago, I wrote a note to myself over the thumbnail to ensure that I would see it when I was writing the script. It says, quote unquote, try not to sound like an absolute tool. So, I'm gonna try. In reality, this might just be my most objective review ever, since my score and my personal feelings really don't match on this one. We'll get into that, but first, how this flight came to be. When I search for flights, sometimes I'm just looking for whatever jumps out at me, without a solid plan in mind. But in today's case, I needed to get to New York. I was searching from this general region and found this surprising fare. Delhi to New York JFK via Singapore for around $1,500 one way in business. Generally, one way fares on this routing are in the $2,300 to $2,900 range. So I lucked out. I knew I wanted to do another trip to India as well, so this all just fit together quite nicely. Arriving at Delhi's Indira Gandhi International Airport in the late afternoon is a wee bit chaotic. After weaving my way through the crowds and finding the shortest security line outside, I was soon enough inside the massive check-in hall, looking for SQ. By the way, SQ is short for Singapore Airlines and I'm going to be using it a lot in this video. SQ has more than one daily flight to Delhi, so I was sure to choose the one that was usually served by an A380. For me, it was a double positive to pick the A380. First, I've never reviewed the A380 business class seat, and second, there's that super slim, never gonna happen but we might as well try, chance that an upgrade for first might be available. SQ has a very rigid and no-nonsense upgrade system called My SQ Upgrade, and generally, when available, they send an email out to eligible passengers around a week in advance. I stalked my email mildly obsessively for seven days. Nada. When I checked in, I asked if there was, by chance, any cash upgrades available. There definitely are, sir. I asked how much, my body so tense I could hardly breathe. 88,000 rupees, sir. Immediately, I knew that was within the maximum $1,400 agreement that I had made with myself a few days prior, and I said I'll take it. I was quite literally buzzing, my mind so far out in the clouds that I thought 2F sounded like a better seat than 1F. It's not, by the way. I went over to the ticketing counter to make the payment, and the agent specifically asked me if I wanted to keep my book the cook business class meal choice, or choose from the first class menu. Very matter-of-factly, I chose the latter. A few moments later, he reconfirmed that I wanted the first class menu and not the dish that I pre-chose. Correct. Okay. Boarding pass in hand. Now I just needed to make sure that this thing isn't bent for the next 32 hours or so. My thanks to the wonderful immigration officer for bending it 90 seconds later. So I have many SQ reviews on the channel already, which go through the full gamut of company history. They're cycling through above now and will all be linked in the description. For today though, I want to keep this more focused on the A380 and SQ's relationship with it. First though, let's head to the lounge, the Air India First Class Lounge to be specific. Don't get too excited. But at least, it's not the Encom Lounge. Inside, there's plenty of seating, with only one other passenger on this side of the lounge. The business class side seen here is a little bit busier, but not that bad.
All of the food that you see is shared for both sides. Of the strides that I've seen from Air India so far in their revamping, I'll say that lounge cleanliness is at the forefront of that. So, Singapore Airlines, formerly Malaysia Singapore Airlines, formerly Malaysian Airways, formerly Malayan Airways, and I use formerly quite loosely here, currently has 152 aircraft in its fleet, 12 of which are A380s. Originally, they had 19 of them, but during COVID and renovations of the model, they retired seven of them, which really isn't too surprising since they were the oldest A380s out there. In 2007, Singapore Airlines was the launch customer for the A380, first to fly, quite the title to have for such a significant aircraft. On those initial whales, as they're so perfectly called, SQ introduced what was effectively the first ever first class suite and renamed the class itself, specifically first class on the A380s, suites. I'll show you a few pics of the original suites later on, but it's kind of remarkable how much inspiration Emirates clearly took from them for their game changer first class. And I say that having just flown that product a few weeks ago. As I make my way to the gate, which will surely be boarding before it's supposed to be, let's look at SQ's A380 network at the moment. While they currently fly to 76 destinations across the globe, including the longest flight on Earth, my next trip report, throughout the year, the A380 just sees nine of them, and they're not all year round. Auckland will be starting just around the same time as this video is published, and Frankfurt is reported to come back next summer. Each of the current destinations sees A380 service once or twice daily. SQ's configuration has a total of 471 seats, with the entire upper deck being first and business class. And what did I tell you? More than half have already boarded already. Boarding time didn't even officially start yet. Okay, let's get on board and I'll explain what I meant about my most objective review ever comment. All reviews that I make are based on the price that I paid and what I consider to be reasonable expectations for the brand or airline or class of service, location, what have you. Generally speaking, and I understand how some people will think this sounds absurd, but I do try to remove my own personal taste an opinion and put myself into the shoes of who I think would actually be paying for this experience themselves, whether it's a flight or a hotel. 95% of the time, my personal opinions are closely aligned with my scores. Today, there's a bit of a divide though, since personally, I would not fly sweets again. But that doesn't mean that you won't love it. Let's take a look at today's flight stats. Despite our early boarding, we ended up taking off around half an hour late, but still ended up landing a few minutes early after our five-hour flight at 39,000 feet. There were three jet bridges tonight, two for the lower deck and one for the upper deck with business and first sharing. I don't think there are any airports that use four jet bridges, are there? I was warmly greeted as I stepped on board, and as always, props to SQ Flight Crew for being able to instantly spot a name on a boarding pass, and in my case also, KFG or Chris Flyer Gold. Welcome back Mr. So-and-so, is definitely one of the smallest things that can be done upon boarding that has one of the greatest impacts on the passenger experience. And here we are. Besides flying private or flying in the Etihad residence, I do believe that this is the most space that you can claim for yourself on board any commercial aircraft. Each suite is around 50 square feet. So if you look at this with a bit of an avgeek math brain, that's a thousand dollar upgrade divided by 50 square feet divided by five hours. So in my mind, I would say $4 per square foot hour is a very good upgrade deal. Let's take a closer look at the cabin layout with a graphic that I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty chuffed about. Like I said, the plane has 471 seats, but with just six suites up here, we don't even make up one and a half percent of the total seats on the plane. In this same space, Emirates has 12 first class seats and Etihad has 10, including the residents. Here, just six. Emirates has one version of the A380 without first class, so they have an economy section up here. Wanna guess how many economy seats can fit in this same space as six suites? Go ahead, guess. 72. Let's zoom in for a better look. Each suite has a beautifully upholstered Poltrona Frau leather armchair, and when you first arrive, that's just about all you can actually see, in terms of furniture at least. The seat swivels in all directions, so you could sit and look directly at the window, with the built-in vanity mirror in front of you. 
though knee space in this direction is a bit tight. If you turn it back around to face the opposite corner, you'll be in the perfect position for dining, well, the only position for dining, which also happens to be the perfect position to stare across the aisle at your suite mate who you've never met before. Though, in this case, all of the crew were very good about minimizing that by keeping the doors shut during meal services. After dinner, you can partially lounge in the chair, though frankly it doesn't recline nearly enough, especially for leisurely day flights. And of course, finally, the crew can make up your bed for you, which, if I'm honest, is surprisingly narrow. That's just about the same width as all Apex Suites business class beds. Okay, so as we look around some of the more self-explanatory but beautiful parts of the suite, I'll quickly tell you why personally, this is nowhere near my favorite first class product. I'm talking about the hard product. Here comes the don't sound like a tool part. It just doesn't make sense. There is so much wasted space in here, and yet when you're actually using it, it doesn't feel spacious. It's a square. Why? Etihad gives you the same fixtures, but in a more efficient layout. Yes, I know that most people love the spaciousness of it. But again, I'm talking about my own personal thoughts right now. And for me, I like efficient and thoughtful design. Not quasi house furniture put into a square room. The beds are narrow and hard. The chair itself is fine, but it's nothing super comfortable like Emirates Game Changer. Like I said, the crew are attentive with the doors, but come on. Why on earth was looking at the aisle the chosen eating position? Then the bathrooms. One of them is massive, but there's no showers. Why? My recent shower in Etihad's first class was divine with a capital D. When SQ launched the product, they literally said, we asked our customers and they said a shower was not a priority for them. I don't buy that for a second. If the appeal of a shower in the 12th hour of a 14 hour flight doesn't appeal to you, we can't be friends. Lastly, this is partially due to the nature of the A380 itself. But because you're kind of far away from the window during takeoff and landing, combined with the quietness of these birds, it just doesn't feel like you're flying. You feel quite detached from the experience. It actually made me feel like perhaps I might prefer their old suites, which they debuted in 2007. You can see a few pictures of them here. I haven't seen the pictures in quite a while, but I have to say that they did kind of age pretty well. Okay. Done. I think I kept that to about a 6.5 out of 10 on the tool scale. Just my honest impressions. Everything else I'm going to say going forward is based on my score, which is based on what the average first class passenger likely thinks of the product. Do you ever wonder why I and other content creators ask you to click that thumbs up button and subscribe? Well, there's two main reasons. First, it's easy to forget to do, so this is your little reminder. Secondly, it truly does help the channel continue to grow by increasing engagement. So please, click it, subscribe, and share with family and friends. If you'd like to support me even further, my Patreon is linked in the description below. Thanks very much in advance. Just for a bit of size reference. As far as the finishes go, everything is truly top notch, and I do like the color palette on board. It's very calming and very SQ. Upon boarding, each suite has an amenity kit, which would have been nice if they presented it a little bit nicer, headphones, slippers, and menus. Shortly after being seated, you'll be offered pajamas and a pre-departure drink. Krug is not served on the ground at outstations, so I saved room for later. While seated with the door closed, there's certainly enough privacy, but keep in mind that the walls don't go to the ceiling if that's important to you.
My all-time favorite safety video began to roll, and I, I think I finally actually sat down at this point. We pushed back, and then they played the sweet demonstration video. Keep in mind that while the TV does swivel, for taxi, takeoff, and landing, your TV and your seating position will be at a 90 degree angle to each other. Not ideal. This is in part due to the fact that the walls between rows 1 and 2 lower to combine into a double suite. Row 1 suites are slightly bigger and do have a second monitor directly in front of you for the taxi and takeoff seating position. Okay, I'm gonna catch my breath for a minute and go make a cup of coffee. The spool up, takeoff, and airport stats are coming up next. Very soon after takeoff, I was brought a glass of crew, which I ordered while on the ground, where I also ordered my meal. The crew was crisp, and at $240 a bottle was a nice way to officially start the occasion. But a bit of bad news did also accompany this. Have a look at the excellent entertainment system as I tell you about it. So apparently... The check-in agent on the ground was way, way, way off base. I mentioned that he confirmed with me twice that I wanted the first-class menu. Not only was he wrong, but according to my outstanding crew, it is never an option, at least in Delhi, to choose a main course from the first-class menu if you upgraded the day of departure. If you use Book the Cook, you'll get your business class selection, and if you didn't order, you'll choose from the business class main dishes on offer. All of the other food would be from the first class menu though. Meal service began with satay service, which frankly, I always want six more portions of. While she didn't explicitly say this, my flight attendant did lead me to believe that although the cabin today was full, that only one of them was actually a purchase ticket. The rest were all upgrades. And so there was only one tali on board available for the booked passenger. Not a huge deal, just surprised that the agent on the ground was so far off base. While we wait for the rest of the meal to begin, let's take a look at some of the amenities on board. The very smart looking black and white amenity kit was from Lalique, 
and was a really nice kit overall. While I do collect every kit that I get, it's rare that I actually end up using all of the products inside. So in this case, the Neroli scent was really nice and the house scent was a nice touch as well. Like I said, the meal mix-up in the moment was not a huge deal, but after seeing that I was disappointed, the flight attendant offered me the other amenity kit as well, which I let her know in no uncertain terms truly did make up for it in my mind. SQ uses different kits depending on if you're departing from or arriving to Singapore. This all-black kit is normally for the flights originating in Singapore and was thoroughly loved by me even more than the first one. The chunky, full-size fragrance was a nice surprise. The headphones were Bang & Olufsen, and they're just about as good as you're going to get on any airline in flight, though I do think they're a bit heavy. As for the pajamas, they're soft and cozy, but in a very standard jersey knit kind of way. Besides the Lalique branding, there's really not much to be excited about here. Then we have the eye mask and some very, very fancy looking slippers, which were decently comfortable. I imagine that one would wear these slippers in their cigar room while having a bit of cognac. Finally, we have the throw blanket and the pillow that was at the seat on boarding. The blanket is basically like a cross between Etihad's old business class blanket and Qatar's current. It's soft and plush and pretty substantial. The pillow, on the other hand, is pretty stiff and clearly more of an ornamental piece as opposed to something you're actually going to be cuddling with. But don't worry, you'll get proper pillows during turndown. Note though, I do love the fact that the back of the pillow, covered in velvet, had not a spot of lint on it. Okay, time for dinner. Tables were set with beautiful understated china. My champagne was refilled, probably for the fourth time, and here is the full menu. When looking at the wines and the whiskies, please note that the red prices are my additions to the graphics to give you an idea of what these bottles might retail for in the US. If you enjoy first class content, be sure to hit that subscribe button because I've got seven or eight more first class videos from an array of airlines coming out in the next year. To go with my meal, I chose the 2015 Louis Latour Grand Cru, which goes for around $50 a bottle. But that wasn't actually on board, and I was offered a similar Burgundy, which went for $140 a bottle. So, no complaints from me. I started off with what was simply called antipasto. It was certainly a hefty portion, but for a starter, I've had like 12 iterations of this dish in business class. Next up was the cream of mushroom soup, which was really delicious. For the main course, let me just preface this by saying that I'm judging this dish as a business class course, since that's what it is. But even for a business class course, this is beyond sad. I ordered the assorted tandoori meat kebabs, and while technically the dish was true to its name, it was the driest and most uninspired dish that I've ever seen on SQ. And the flatbread? I'm not even sure what type of flatbread they were attempting to make for this one. It felt like it was filled with semi-hard glue. We finished off with a trio of desserts, a cheese plate, which was definitely the highlight, a lemon curd cake with quote-unquote citrus salad, yes, you're looking at salad, which was very mediocre, and the fruit was fruity. Overall, a pretty disappointing meal, except for the soup. After that, I had a venture to the larger of the two bathrooms, and I apologize that a 10 second toilet tour won't be available today, since this bathroom is larger than my first apartment in New York. It is a bathroom though, so it's pretty self-explanatory, so let me briefly talk about the service on board. It was flawless. Out of 10, I generally think Singapore service floats between 6 to 9. It's always better than neutral, but never quite perfect. 
today bucked that trend for me for sure. It's clear that these suites are aspirational experiences, and the crew understands that well and does a nice job of balancing their service between being excited for you as well as being genuinely helpful and poised and professional as SQ crew always are. While I was in the bathroom, my bed was turned down and it was looking pretty plush. I have two praises and two critiques. The critiques first. You can't see this, but that bed is hard as a rock and for no good reason. When folded away, which it has to be most of the time, it serves no other purpose. So please tell me, why couldn't it be a high quality memory foam or even some sort of real mattress? Second critique, the size of the bed. It's 26 inches wide, which like I said, I think is a bit narrow, but my real complaint is about the length. It's 73 inches or 185 centimeters long. For reference, I'm 71 inches tall or 181 centimeters. And when lying down, my knees had to be slightly bent. For a business class seat, this size would be fine. But for a space this large and this prestigious, there's no reason for the bed to be that small. As for the two things that I enjoyed, first up were the linens and finishes themselves. Very high quality, straight out of a really nice hotel. While there was a mattress pad, it wasn't really doing that much. Second thing I liked was that the head part ratcheted up to an angle so you could watch TV from the bed in a semi-lounge position. Just for reference sake, here's the other first class restroom, which is a lot smaller than the other one, but let's be honest, is still two or three times larger than most others on any other aircraft. The same Lalique amenities were on offer. So as we approach Singapore, let's see if I can't wrap this up neatly. It is undoubtedly a special product, but it could have been so much more. With that amount of space, the possibilities should have been endless. Not a bed that's too small, with a chair that doesn't really lounge that well, in a dining position that you have to be staring at your neighbor, possibly. Honestly, I just don't get it. Overall, the food was very middle of the road, and the main dish aside, anything else that I ate could have easily been served in business class. At least the service and some of the amenities on board did make up for that. So should you do it? This is a tough one. If you can get a good deal on an upgrade or a good redemption deal, then sure, go for it for the novelty of the experience alone. For cash tickets, I would say it's only worth it if flying to London, Frankfurt, Australia, or New Zealand. For all of the other destinations, business class will do just fine. And let me just note that there are some other first class products that I've flown since this one that I haven't talked about at all yet. And there are in fact some first class products that I'd pay for a two hour flight to be on. So it's not just first class is never worth it for me, just to be clear on that. So as we taxi to the gate into plane, was I disappointed? No, I've seen enough videos and reviews of this suite to know exactly what I was going to get and I'm still thrilled that I had the chance to fly it. But this is likely a one and done experience for me. But interestingly enough though, it did get me thinking about their first class on their 777. I have a sneaking suspicion that I might actually enjoy that a bit more than these suites. One final benefit of my upgrade today for my six hour layover is that I get access to the private room. That's coming up on my JFK flight coming up next week. I really do hope that you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please be sure to click that thumbs up button and hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming content. I will see you next time from the incredible Six Senses Fort Berwara Resort. Oh, and thanks for watching until the end.